you know, it happens a lot to me that I come across people who tell me that they love horror and they love musicals, though the two of them don't often uh, intertwine with each other, <laughs> right? But when they do, it creates something really beautiful and weird, right? Like, I'm one of those people. I, I love horror, obviously. I love musicals. I'm, I'm a fan. I love musicals like Grease, Rocky Horror Picture Show, Sweeney Todd, Phantom of the Opera. Like, I love musicals. That's, that's just who I am. And musicals, I find they can create a really creepy experience when you mix the music with the atmosphere of the movie. It just makes it so much more creepy <laughs> when you add music to it, especially depending on the style of music. Like if you're doing something that's a little bit dark and macabre and the music's like upbeat, it can really change your perception and your feelings while you're watching that movie. Like scores themselves, not even just musicals, but scores in horror movies, I feel are the most important thing outside of the killer and the characters. Like the score is what builds the intensity. It builds that suspense for you and can even build that fear, right? Like Michael Myers, you hear that sound, you hear that iconic do, 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 you know he's fucking coming. <laughs> like music is so important in horror movies. And when you take the musical aspect and then you blend it with horror to create a horror musical, it's just fucking beautiful. <laughs> One of the reasons that I see the two work so well is because the connection between myself and both genres is based on emotions, right? Like music hits you harder than just words do sometimes. And of course, what comes to mind first when I speak of musical horror is, of course, Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> like that movie captured every aspect that you would want to find in musicals and horror movies. Like we want fear. We want imagination. What better way to portray it than having a transsexual scientist create a human? <laughs> like, the concept itself is obviously campy, but it works so well. Like, Rocky Horror Picture Show, to this day, still has a cult following. And in fact, it's a movie I'll probably end up reviewing on the podcast at one point. I just don't consider it to be a horror movie, necessarily, but I, I totally see how a lot of people do. Like, these horror movie musicals, they really outline the quirkiness and unique storylines that are possible when you blend the two genres together. Like, it's a subgenre that consists of, really, two very opposite elements, right? Musical and horror. When you blend the two, there's no way it's going to create something quote-unquote normal right? It's going to be strange. It's going to be weird. And it's going to catch the attention of us in the horror community, right? I feel like that's why a lot of us love horror musicals so much because we just, we love weird shit. <laughs> that's, that's who we are, right? Well, I guess the word unique I should use because the word unique is becoming a lot more and more relevant when you're talking about these kinds of horror movies. They're not weird. They're unique. <laughs> And another thing that we want that Rocky Horror Picture Show was really good in doing is mystery, right? The entire film is basically a mystery because the concept is never really fully explained at any point. Like the house itself and Dr. Frankenfurter, they're a mystery to Brad and Janet completely. And then after a while, their whole existence becomes a mystery to them. On the other side of things, there are the features of musicals, right? Where we, we want to see and we want to hear catchy songs with lyrics we can remember. And we want to feel alive when we listen to it, right? Like, I don't know about you, but every time that I watch Rocky Horror Picture Show, those lips come on the screen, I just start singing instantly. Like, science fiction. Like, who doesn't? <laughs> you know? And of course, you know, I've got other favorite horror musicals, right? Like Sweeney Todd. I love Sweeney Todd. But we're going to talk about my favorite horror movie musical, Repo the Genetic Opera, which is such an unusual story. Imagine a world that's riddled with addiction to surgery and body augmentation, okay? Within this world, people can receive organ transplants and augmentations on credit, basically. Though it's also legal to repossess those organs and augmentations should you not make your payments on time. Movies that are able to capture the essence of horror alongside musical interludes, they'll always have a special place in my heart. Like, this movie we're about to go over here is just absolutely incredible. It is my favorite horror musical of all time, and I truly consider it to be one of the most underrated horror movies of all time as well. And I think one of the reasons why is because musicals in the horror genre, they're generally perceived as, you know, corny, campy, and just not very very good, right? Like, there are a few exceptions to the rule, obviously, like Rocky Horror Picture Show and Sweeney Todd, though there's one movie I feel that stands itself apart from the rest, and it just doesn't get the credit that it deserves. So in 2008, Repo the Genetic Opera was released, 
and it gave us a new musical entry into the horror genre. And it's considered a movie that's a science fiction, gothic, rock, opera, horror film. And I know that sounds like it could be a recipe for disaster, but it's amazing. And the cast? Star-studded. It's actually directed by the Saw 2 director, Darren Lynn Bowsman, and it's based off a musical of the same name. It stars Alexa Vega, Paul Sorvino, Anthony Head, Sarah Brightman, Paris Hilton, Bill Mosley, and Terrence Sudnich. Repo was first performed as a stage play for many years, when it was adapted into a 10-minute short film by Darren Lynn Bowsman. The short film was directed and financed by Bowsman, who used it to pitch the idea to different studios. The short film was also star-studded. It actually starred Shawnee Smith, right, at Amanda Young from the Saw series, as Amber Sweet. Michael Rooker was casted as the Repo Man. Like, that's that alone right there is a star-studded cast, so... Repo made its premiere at the Fantasia Film Festival in the summer of 2008, and it made a very limited release uh, later on that year in November. It was then that the movie began to develop a cult following. It was really similar to that of Rocky Horror Picture Show, where fans would don costumes of their favorite characters, start performing alongside the film in theaters, and the support from the fans really gave Repo the help it needed to become that cult classic that it is today. Lionsgate themselves, they did very little <laughs> when, it, when it came to the promotion of the film, which left Bowsman and Zunich completely alone to do pretty much all of their own promotion. <laughs> like, they were the reason Repo was even known to anybody. The two of them actually, along with a whole bunch of other cast members, they went on a Repo road tour in conjunction with the film's release so that they could try and bring more attention towards the movie. The tour itself it involved a one-night screening of the film in seven different cities across the United States, and then an extensive Q&A session followed after each screening. The tour was then extended to Britain because of the high number of tickets sold at each event during the tour. And after the initial theatrical release of Repo, it went on to see success with DVD sales. And the support from the fans caused it to actually be re-released caused it to be re-released in select theaters in 2009 right up into 2014. And it's that fandom and popular cult following that really keeps the spirit of Repo alive today. Like, I know there's so many people out there that still love Repo, still watch Repo. Personally, I would kill for a sequel to Repo. I don't even care what the story is. I just want to see all of those characters come back and do something just as iconic, weird, and campy as Repo is. So, without further ado, let's talk about Repo, the genetic opera, everything that happens in this awesomely amazing musical horror movie. So, the year is 2056 and there's an epidemic of organ failures across the globe. So everybody's dying from organ failures. Organ transplants are available from the mega corporation Geneco, but they don't come cheap. Don't worry though, you can actually get your organ transplants on credit. <laughs> How weird of a concept is that? That you're in a world where organ transplants are available from corporations basically, and you can basically use a credit card to get yourself an organ transplant and continue your life. But the thing is, you don't want to miss a payment because organ repossessions are also legalized, which means that clients who miss their payments are going to be hunted down by the repo men who are skilled assassins that repossess organs from clients who can't pay on time. And the movie really does an amazing job of creating this creepy, gothic, cyberpunk atmosphere right at the beginning of the movie and then continuing it throughout the entire film. Like, the beginning gives you that essence, which will carry with you the whole time you're watching Repo. After learning more about the world that our characters get placed in, we begin to get more backstory on the characters themselves. We first see Jinko CEO, Rotissimo Rotti Largo. He discovers that he's terminally ill, and he's going to need to select a suitable heir to the Jinko legacy. Rotti has three children, named Luigi, Pavi, and Amber. They're all constantly bickering over who should inherit Jinko, and none of Roddy's children are worthy enough to him as heirs to this massive fortune. And they refuse to notice the fact that none of them are actually heirs to this massive fortune. They keep fighting amongst themselves as to who's going to get it. Little do they know, none of them are actually going to get it. And then the story pans over to Shiloh. Shiloh is going to be the focal point of our story. She's inherited a rare blood disease, which requires her to stay indoors despite her longing for the outside world. Her father, his name is Nathan. He's completely overprotective, obviously for good reason, though we find out that he also believes that he is the cause of his wife's death. The reason being is because his wife was suffering from a terminal illness, and Nathan developed what he believed to be a cure for the terminal illness, 
Unfortunately, it ended up being the death of her. She took the cure and she ended up dying. However, the fact that Nathan believes this is not necessarily the truth. Because afterwards, we find out that Rotti had actually been the one who poisoned his wife. He did so by poisoning the cure that Nathan developed to help save his wife from the terminal illness. Reason being, Roddy was in love with Nathan's wife. <laughs> Old school love story, right? And he felt rejected because she actually left Roddy for Nathan. This was his way of enacting revenge on her for the pain that she caused him. And then, <laughs> right, Roddy's an evil dude. He then uses this incident as blackmail against Nathan, and he forces him into becoming Jinko's head repo man, while at the same time leading Shiloh to believe that he's actually just a doctor. So one night, while Nathan was working as Jinko's repo man, Shiloh ends up sneaking out of the house, and she visits her mother's tomb. This is where she runs into my favorite character of the entire movie, the grave robber. <laughs> I love Terran Sunich for his role as the grave robber. He was so charismatic. He looked the role. His voice is incredible. Grave robber, definitely my favorite character. Despite the fact that Bill Mosley's probably my favorite actor in this movie, at, like, in general, <laughs> grave robber is definitely my favorite character of this movie. I love this dude. So who the grave robber is, is he's a man who desecrates corpses to exact Zydrate. What Zydrate is, is a euphoric and addictive pain filler, which he then uses to sell to addicts on the street. This is the same kind of thing that those who are addicted to surgery, they will use this as some sort of, you know, painkiller, in a sense, to help get through the pain of surgery. While Shiloh's outside secretly in the world, she ends up getting lured by Rotti. They head over to Jinko's fair while he promises her that he has a cure for her terminal illness. So we arrive at Jinko's fair, which is very reminiscent of circus shows from the 60s, though a bit more of a gothic cyberpunk feel. Pretty cool set. We witness the Largo brothers arguing amongst each other over the inheritance of Jinko, while Amber ends up harassing Jinko's biggest prize, Blind Mag, who is played by the absolutely iconic and incomparable Sarah Brightman. Don't know who Sarah Brightman is? Go find the original Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom of the Opera to start, because Sarah Brightman is amazing. <laughs> I love Sarah Brightman. So Blind Mag is an opera singer, of course, <laughs> who was born blind, though with the help of Gene Co., she's given surgically enhanced eyes in exchange for working under Gene Co. indefinitely. So kind of like making a deal with the devil there. At the fair, Grave Robber shows up and he ends up spotting Shiloh. He helps her escape while encountering several of his surgery-addicted customers, including Amber, who actually had skipped the fair that she was <laughs> expected to speak at. And the reason why she skipped the fair was because she is addicted to Zydrate. And her addiction to Zydrate has now proven to her father she is not worthy of Gene Co.'s inheritance, right? She just publicly embarrassed the guy by not showing up for her speech at the fair. So now we know... Definitely, Amber's out. <laughs> we then find out that not only is Blind Meg under contract pretty much for the rest of her life, her eyes themselves are also property of Gene Co. And she's also expected to be resigning from the corporation soon. So we know where this is going, right? This means that Meg's eyes are actually marked for repossession now, and she's going to end up being replaced, which is a subplot that will unfold near the ending of the movie. And everything gets broken up by Gene Cops arriving at the scene. Grave Robber and Shiloh, they quickly part ways. Amber gets taken back to her father at Gene Co. to get a lashing, obviously. Shiloh ends up making her way back to the house before her dad Nathan comes back and notices that she's missing. Now we know that Blind Mag is on the path towards retirement. Nathan gets brought into Gene Co. offices by Roddy to repossess Mag's eyes. Nathan right up front refuses to do it because she was the closest friend that his wife ever had. So there's no way he is going to desecrate his wife's memory, make her turn in her grave by going over and pretty much taking the eyes of her of his late wife's best friend. So this of course completely infuriates Rati and he then vows that he's going to kill Nathan the first chance that he has. So we head over back at the house. This is the first time that Mag gets to visit Shiloh. And we learn that Meg is actually Shiloh's godmother and was told that Shiloh had died at birth by Nathan. So Meg had no idea that Shiloh was still alive. The first time she saw her actually was that quick interaction they had at the fair. So that's what triggered all these memories for Meg and she went, oh my god, Shiloh's alive and Nathan lied to me. So Meg warns Shiloh not to make the same mistakes that she did. 
Nathan, of course, then comes home and he's not fucking happy that Meg has shown up at his house. So he forces her out. And the story then moves forward to close out its remaining plot points. We see Roddy at Jeanco, and he's writing his will, which outlines that the heir to Jeanco's throne, the sole heir, is actually going to be Shiloh. Surprise! (laughs) Roddy then invites Shiloh to the opera, while Nathan at the same time is being pursued by Jean Cops because he's heading towards the opera looking for Shiloh and refuses to take Blind Mag's eyes. At the opera, Amber makes her grand stage debut with one of the best practical effects in this movie. So as she's performing on stage doing her bit, her face begins to slowly peel off and then eventually comes completely detached, falling on the floor in front of the audience. Reason being is because she's addicted to surgery. She's addicted to Zydrate. So the more plastic surgery you have eventually, it's just going to fall off. It's just... (laughs) So her face just falls on the floor in front of the audience, which of course didn't go very well. But uh, after that performance was Blind Meg, and she completes her final performance for Jean Co., though deviates from the grand finale and completely denounces the Largo family, which was a great moment because next she actually gouges out her own eyes in an act of defiance. So that Jean Co., can't repossess her eyes in the end and they don't get what they want out of her she is in control and she proves that by gouging out her eyes (laughs) so immediately after doing that roddy cuts the cords that were suspending meg above the stage and ends up impaling her on a fence to her death the audience of course is is gasping in horror (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right? Roddy is assuring them that, you know, oh, Meg's death is all part of the show. This whole thing's just been a part of the show, you know, gouging out eyes for fucking entertainment. Like, what? But anyways, it's at this point that the Repo Man shows up and gets attacked by Shiloh. Because she doesn't realize yet that, you know, it's her father underneath the mask. But during the struggle, she ends up finding out that her dad is the Repo Man. So, of course, Shiloh confronts him, right, about all of his lies. And then it's revealed by Roddy that Shiloh doesn't actually have a blood disease, right? Nathan has been poisoning her with the medicine that she receives. This is what Roddy claims. And he continues to describe how the control Nathan had over her was to protect her from the outside world while being unable to cope with the loss of his wife. Roddy then tells Shiloh that he's promising Jean Co to her. However, she has to kill her father. Of course, though, she refuses to do it. (laughs) And this causes Roddy to gather up his last bit of strength and shoot Nathan, who eventually succumbs to his injuries, unfortunately. After a morning session between Shiloh and her father, she leaves and decides not to let her father's actions dictate her future. After she flees, Jinko's got no legal heir. So that puts the company in limbo. The inheritor actually becomes Amber. She gets the company because she had auctioned off her fallen face from the opera to charity. That's how she inherited it, by auctioning off her fallen face. And that's how the movie ends. Uh, I know it sounds campy, I know it sounds a little bit ridiculous, but trust me, it's the soundtrack of this movie, and the way the scenes are shot, the ambiance, the sets, the characters, the costumes, everything has its place. It's not just one single focus, like, oh, the shots were really good, that made the movie, or, oh, the sets were really good. Everything was good. Everything about this movie just wrapped it up into one awesome experience. Like, everything about this movie is so well executed. From the practical effects, to the musical numbers, all the way to the impeccable casting of each character. And while everyone around Roddy sees tragedy in this epidemic going on with organ transplants and things of the sort, Roddy sees it as an opportunity. The ability to just absolve himself and his company of any fault and increase his revenue along the way, all while conveniently operating under a guise of altruism. This is the crucial plot point for the story. And it draws a lot of comparisons to reality, right? Because without mass idolization and adoration, many forms of evil under capitalism would just be stopped in their tracks, right? Like, I'm not wrong. <laughs> People who generate revenue at the lowest levels for massive companies like Geneco, they're the ones who are most susceptible to illness because they have limited access to health care. They have a poor diet. They have regular exposure to the world, things like that. Massive profits for a corporation wouldn't be possible without low-paid employees, which is the only crisis that Geneco and Roddy truly saw in these mass graves beneath the city. 
However, as greed is rewarded, it's never satiated in real life or on screen. Getting surgery in this movie is, is it's almost like it's marketed as a fashion statement, onboarding the rich to parade as success stories and walking billboards. So with all the surgeries going on, of course they have to have a drug to help with the pain, and that's where Zydrate comes in. And then we also see corruption leak into their judicial system by legalizing organ repossession. Now the plan comes full circle. Whether those in poverty continue to work is irrelevant, as failure to make their payments only ensures pure profit to Geneco, because they're able to resell their organs again at full price. Repo really makes you see firsthand that a system designed to obtain wealth by any means requires poverty to profit. It shows the ease with which this structure can be exploited. Those who are in power have the power to exploit it with the aid of passive compliance and desperation from the public. <laughs> And if you've seen this movie before, like, a massive reason to revisit the film is the unique perspective that we get to see from Shiloh. You know, like, while everyone around her has been slowly manipulated into upholding the way this world works, the daughter of the Repo Man lives her life forcibly sheltered from the illusion and everything that it entails. And we watch her navigate suddenly being exposed to this outside world. And the thing is, others in that world have been eased into it. They didn't get that kind of sudden exposure that Shiloh got. The first time I watched this movie, I was just really engaged and encapsulated by the overall atmosphere of everything. Like, there's a lot <laughs> that goes on in this movie. Like, just visually and from an audio perspective and then a character development perspective, there really is a lot that goes on in Repo. And that's really what I was focusing on when I was first watching Repo. Well, I don't even, I don't know if I call it focus <laughs> because I was just like a squirrel. I'm like, oh my God, look at all the awesome things. Look, Bill Mosley, Sarah Brightman, awesome, cool colors, blood. Oh my God. Like it was, it was a lot. Second time I watched it, I really focused on Bill Mosley and his character because I absolutely love Bill Mosley. He's hands down probably my favorite horror actor, if not my top three. He's on my Mount Rushmore of horror actors, hands down. I love Bill Mosley. So I really focused on him and his character and his portrayal. And then the third time, I found myself really watching and looking at things from Shiloh's perspective. And I found it to be a very interesting way to watch the movie because it's completely different different in terms of feel and connection than it is if if you look at it from any other perspective or you're just looking at the movie from a bird's eye view because really when you think about it you've got this world on the outside that is in absolute chaos right sheer chaos people are dying people are getting organ transplants on credit then they're not paying their bill and they're getting their organs repossessed and on top of that the world is stricken by poverty people are grave robbing to steal zydrate there's drug addiction it's just not a good world overall and shiloh's completely sheltered from this right like she isn't exposed to this outside world in any way she has no idea what is going on out there and what everybody else is having to experience in their lives and that's a really unique perspective to take when you're watching repo looking at it from shiloh's perspective especially when she goes to the outside world when she finally gets the strength and courage and leaves the house without nathan knowing about it then she gets exposure to the outside world at this point it's at this point that you really get to experience the perspective of Shiloh because you get to see the world as she sees it, right? This is all new to her. She has no idea that people are robbing graves for Zydrate. She doesn't even know what Zydrate is. And she doesn't understand at the same time what's actually happening, which is another reason why Roddy was so easily able to manipulate her into doing whatever he wanted her to do is because she doesn't know the, the horrors or the, the terrors that are going on in society right now. She doesn't know nor understand. So by watching the movie from that perspective, it really gives you a new take on Repo. And it helps you look past all of the campiness, the blood, the gore, and really drill down to the core story of this when it comes to Shiloh's character development. And it kind of gives you a different take on what's going on because you're not necessarily looking at it from the addiction-fueled society or the citizen who's addicted to Zydrate or surgery. You're looking at it from the perspective of a girl who's literally being held captive in a sense because she has a quote-unquote illness that she doesn't know anything about, she doesn't know if it's true. Like, looking at it from that perspective you have a whole new outlook on the movie. And I hope you guys really enjoyed going over Repo the Genetic Opera. Like I said, it's my favorite horror movie musical. If you follow me on Instagram, you also probably know it's my comfort movie. <laughs> I talk about Repo on Instagram quite a lot because I want the word to get out. And that's another reason why I 
pick movies like this to talk about on the podcast because while I do go over some that you know are well known like obviously everyone knows Michael Myers and the Halloween movies uh, people are now getting to know Terrifier people know Evil Dead I go a lo- over a lot of well known horror movies but I also want to go over the ones that I consider to be hidden gems right like the horror movies that you yourself may not have even ever heard of because there was a time that I hadn't heard of Repo like I didn't know about it until I found it on Tubi one day and decided I wanted a gore fest and I checked it out Really glad I did, though. So that's why I like going over these movies, because I really just want to get the word out. And I want to spread the knowledge of horror that I have with other people, because you may not have that knowledge. You may not know some of these movies exist. So I really hope that you enjoyed this episode, and that maybe you'll even go check out Repo if you've never watched it before. Or if you have, go check it out again. It's worth a rewatch. I'm watching it right now as I'm recording this episode of the podcast. Like, and I've probably watched it two or three times in the past month. So I love Repo. I hope you enjoy the movie as well. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Next week, we're going to go over something really super cool. I'll be back again next week with a brand new episode. I've got a few episodes written in the hopper. Not quite sure which one I'm going to release yet, (laughs) but you will definitely be getting to hear from me next Tuesday. And stay tuned for some awesome updates coming out of the Cabin of Horrors over the next couple of months. We're going to be launching a couple of things. One of them is going to be subscriber-only episodes. So if you're listening to me on Spotify, you'll be able to subscribe, which supports me in helping me get some better equipment here, (laughs) in all honesty. And uh, you'll be able to subscribe and get exclusive podcast episodes. I'll probably be releasing two episodes extra a month just for subscribers to Spotify. Now, if you're not listening on Spotify and you still want to support and you still want to get all those extra episodes, you can. I'm actually setting up a Patreon that you'll be able to go to, you'll be able to access and subscribe to. The the tiers are starting at two bucks, goes up to five bucks, and you'll be able to get access to not only the subscriber-only episodes that the Spotify listeners get, you'll also get Patreon-exclusive episodes, which will, I believe I'm probably going to do one or two of those a month as well, on Patreon specifically, and those episodes won't be released on podcast platforms. Those are only going to be available to Patreon subscribers. So stay tuned for that. I'll let you know once that launches, once those episodes are out, just in case you want to help support me in really getting better equipment and uh, helping me market the podcast. That's really what I'm doing here. Anytime I get any support from people, whether that be through subscriptions, whether that be through my stuff on Twitch, um, it really just goes towards making Cabin of Horrors better right? I want this to be something that we can all enjoy and something that we can all take from and learn from. So the more you're able to help me, the better equipment I'm able to get, the more I'm able to do this as well. And only if you're comfortable as well. I hate asking for money. Like I feel like I am, but I hate doing that. So only if you're comfortable, if you want to support I'll be posting on Instagram when that goes live and I'll let everyone on the podcast episodes know as well. So stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, see you in the shadows.